Let me just say first that your book, A Beginner's Guide to Constructing the Universe, is a wonderful book filled with amazing discoveries and knowledge about nature's numerical language and how the universe is constructed. It's uh, beautifully put together with diagrams, graphics, images and explanations to how nature is constructed and will give you the logic behind the numbers as well. Uh, I've always had somewhat difficult and uh, most of the time excruciating experiences with math and math teachers and math classes, uh, partly because all these mathematical rules that were thrown out at me and never properly explained. Uh, it was simply so much that didn't make sense to me. And I guess that is the case with inquisitive minds that want to understand why something is in, in a certain way. Uh, just taking the words uh, of the teacher or uh, an authority's words for it is not good enough. But uh, if I and I think most other students as well would have been given just a fraction of some of the wondrous qualities of our 1 to 10 number system that you detail in your book, Michael, I think we would have uh, had a completely different approach uh, to numbers and math overall. So it's wonderful that you've written a book and that you're teaching classes, Michael. I think it's uh, what all children should be given a chance to uh, to learn at least. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I am teaching classes. I teach college classes at the California College of the Arts in San Francisco. And I have my own classroom where I teach whatever I'm interested in, and I seem to uh, have found people who are also interested in it. Yes, uh, it's a shame that children aren't shown the connection between simple numbers, simple shapes, uh, nature and and even art, and it leads into philosophy. It's a very positive outlook. It instead of seeing the world as a crazy, fragmented, dangerous place, uh, we can concentrate on the the beautiful order and harmonies that actually underlie everything. And I think if children are shown the connection just simply of mathematics to nature, it would open everyone's eyes. It would it would change our outlook on not just mathematics, but the entire world, the cosmos, yes. and, and our place in it. Did you come from an interest in, in math or geometry or art or maybe even architecture at, at the beginning before you uh, wrote the book? Well, um, what, as a teenager, as I was about 16, I got very interested in the uh, mathematics of nature, and I decided to get uh, degrees in mathematics so that I could understand this better. That was my real interest in that. Uh, plus, mathematics seemed to me to be a kind of a, uh, a language like poetry. There was something very beautiful in it. Now, I was not a very good mathematics student all through school. I didn't like it at all. It was, uh, seemed to me to be uh, mostly memorization of rules, and it was just overwhelming. It, it, didn't, uh, it, it wasn't taught the way I would have liked it to have been taught. <laughs> Exactly. Same, same from my point of view, Michael. That's what I tried to mention. Just about everybody's. You know, our, yeah. our teachers didn't know this, and their teachers didn't know this. Plus, the emphasis is on, um, you know, getting a job, getting into the high tech, getting all that uh, information, rather than see the uh, beauty, the absolute beauty behind it, uh, and available to everyone. That's, that's the wonderful thing about this. This is not uh, the mathematics of nature uh, and art. Um, and technology is not beyond um, anyone's uh, vision if you understand how to read the simple shapes of things and the simple numbers. You know, we talk about, uh, the, we have the phrase, the book of nature. Well, it's quite, quite true, actually. And if we realize that the, the language in which the book of nature is written is, as Galileo said, uh, an alphabet of simple shapes like triangles, circles, squares, pentagons, and their combinations, uh, you, you can actually read this book. And if you understand this, the, what the shape is about, because there are no accidents you know, in, in nature in the sense that uh, a five-petaled flower is not an accident. There's a reason for that fiveness, for its unfolding, for its, un its harmony, its balance. Um, and if we can read, read the simple shapes, understand what you know, each shape is about, what is the circle about? What is the triangle about? And so forth. We can understand what nature is trying to do in any situation. And then we can work with it rather than against it. That's right. And uh, again, if we look at anything in nature, pretty much, we can slice an apple in half. We can look at how the branches grow of, uh, on, on a tree and how the leaves are composite. These are things that at the initial stage might seem 
chaotic to us and and random but but what you really detail in your book obviously is that all these things have a particular pattern to them and there is a there is a, a logic about how nature creates these things and put them together right oh it's a beautiful and simple logic it's uh, nature is the best teacher you know people have said that nature holds the patent the original patent on every human invention if we look to the way nature does things we'll get the most efficient energy conserving and also beautiful uh, result you see uh, it, it's all readable and, and it's all down to simple shapes it's not uh, we don't need complex equations and graphs and abstract uh, you know formulas and so forth just just start to look at simple shapes nature's uh, you know circles the uh, squares the triangles pentagons hexagons you know, I, I can name dozens of examples for every one of these. And when we start to see them, maybe even the cracks in the sidewalk. Yes. Walk around, we see cracks on the sidewalk. Do we notice that they're uh, usually three corner cracks, like like uh, the capital letter Y in English? You know, the three three meet at one point. Why does nature do three? Sometimes it's four. If it's a very slow crack, it'll crack in four. But three pulls together, you know, very very quickly. And uh, just by noticing ordinary shapes all around us, uh, it enriches our lives. Absolutely. And uh, and there's so much to say, obviously, here in terms of uh, art even. If we look look at art specifically, I I guess one question that's always intrigued me is why people and human beings overall are are attracted to certain shapes and and patterns in art. We're obviously during the Renaissance, many people weren't too savvy to some of these aspects here, but today many people are looking into the sacred geometry that are hidden in a lot of motifs on on, on some of the early Renaissance paintings. These are these continuing to the modern day, of course, as well by artists who are in the know about these things. But why would you say that we are attracted to them? Are, are these symbols also, or or patterns, or numbers? Are they also part of us in in one way? Do they resonate with us, or why are we attracted to them? Do you think? Yes, I, I have to say so. Um, some some people theorize that uh, we are attracted to them because we've been around them in nature so much that we're used to them. But I think it goes even deeper than that. I think it is a part of us, a part of our uh, fabric. We're, we're, we're a legitimate part of this universe just as much as anything else. And we have in us the same, um, shall we call them archetypes in a, in a Jungian sense, archetypal patterns, the idea of uh, equality, we can feel it, and that's the circle. The circle's about equality in all directions as, it, as a circle spreads out from the center. That's one of its things. And the other shapes, they're archetypes within us, and we recognize them. They, they, they feel right. We, we recognize their correctness. And artists, since prehistory, have recognized that certain proportions, the proportions found in the circle, for example, pi, or in the triangle, the square root of three, in the square, the square root of two, certain proportions um, have a more powerful effect on us. And this is what uh, artists, architects, designers, craftspeople of all ages knew. In fact, in certain societies, it was law that you had to create only using certain proportions. Mm. Ancient Egypt, for example. Right. Uh, proportions that would even if you didn't understand them, that you'd be surrounded. Ordinary people in their ordinary utensils and furniture and buildings and art and so forth would be surrounded by certain proportions that would encourage harmonious feelings. They, they knew the laws of this and they, and they, were very, uh, they were very adamant about it. And that's why Egyptian civilization lasted 33 centuries. <laughs> they knew certain things about maintaining harmony within the individual, within the family, within the, within, the, within the town, within the nation. And China was also like this, that if you can maintain harmony at its earliest levels through uh, proportions of objects and also harmonious music, for example, in China, India, Egypt, um, certain music was lawful and certain music and musical rhythms and patterns were unlawful because they would disrupt the peace of the soul and thus the family, thus the town, thus the nation. Mm. Um, you know, that, that's not done in democratic societies. Everything goes. 
<laughs> but in those days, that, that's how they, in, they kept their society uh, enduring, uh, by keeping as closely as possible to the um, proportions, the archetypal proportions found in nature, in their art, and even the design of society. Yeah. You see, do, do but, you but certain certain proportions have a very a more powerful effect on us uh, than others, and and this was the really open secret among artists and architects and craftspeople over many centuries. Do you see more or less of this knowledge coming into the world today? Is there any of this harmonious proportions left at all if we look at some of the modern architecture out there? It's not uh, fashionable today. Uh, artists uh, generally, and in art schools I know, are taught, don't use mathematics in your art. It will kill the living effect of it. And I can understand that. You know, something that's overly designed is just not going to feel alive or really beautiful. And there's not much around today. You know, the, the, the glass boxes throughout our cities and the odd, the odd shapes of buildings they contribute to the feelings of dis-ease, unease, and uh, fragmentation in society. Yes. They don't work to cohere the whole. You know, ancient societies thought in terms of a wholeness, and the parts generally were models in miniature of the whole, just as the, uh, you know, if you hold a leaf up to the light, you'll see in the vein pattern a flattened version of the entire branching pattern of the entire tree. So the idea of designing society as a whole, uh, meant that the architecture was uh, incorporated uh, with it, you know, um, in terms of the uh, the sun and the moon and 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 light and shadow and and so forth. Not much of it today. The world is in a uh, psychological turmoil and confusion. <laughs> People don't know where to look. People feel betrayed uh, and and confused and and worried and so forth but uh, and, 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 and the architecture contributes to that. There's not much of it today. People yeah. are kind of lost but there's also sort of a riptide action occurring that this knowledge is flowing back into the general knowledge. You know pe ordinary people maybe some architects here and there and, and artists are, are using it um, but it's still uh, they're groping at this stage. Yeah. Do, do you see that um, for for our current civilization to even sur survive, it's necessary for us to adopt some of these rules and 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 classical patterns again, both in 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 city design and and architecture, but also art and maybe things that we even have in our in our houses, in our homes as well. Well, it would um, it would certainly help to create beautiful and harmonious objects. Um, around us. Uh, it, it's, you know, artists and scientists and engineers come across this little by little. You know, it, it's, it's the way things actually work and work best. So little by little engineers and scientists and designers, you know, discover it little, little by little. So maybe we're coming back to it. Mm. I, I don't know, but the little by little, I think it's, it's growing from the ground up. Actually, people are recognizing um, that they are not, you know, the idiots that our teachers made us feel that we are in terms of mathematics, <laughs> for example, that we are completely capable of ev understanding everything that nature teaches, everything, if we just understand the simple numbers. Now, I wrote the book, I wrote the book from 1 to 10, although I did include information about 12 in there, and the idea is that if you understand only the numbers 1 through 12, and the shapes that come along with 1 through 12, you have a microcosm of everything that the universe expresses. Yes. You only have to know 1 through 12, and you know everything, really. That's really interesting. And so do you feel that 11 and, and, and 12 is something that you have added on, so to speak, through, through, the, through the years of working with this as well? Or are they equally important numbers uh, to, to, the, to this as well? Yes, they're equally important. Um, I would have gone to fully to 12, 12 chapters. Each chapter is about those numbers. I went to 10 because I really didn't know enough about 11 at the time and I didn't want to leave a big gap there. So I put information about number 12 in the chapter with number six, but one to 12 is complete. See one to, if you understand everything from one to 10, you can understand everything that occurs on earth. 
every all of nature's designs on earth mm-hmm. or as they used to say below the ring of the moon but if you go f- with 11 which is like a, a passageway between two great systems between 10 and 12 and you go to 12 you can understand everything in the complete cosmos beyond earth you see that's so re- one re- to 12 is it that's really interesting. I just want to mention that because 11 is considered to be the that passing point in, in the Kab- uh, Kabbalistic system as well, I think. It's known as the Doth, uh, and and it's like the entry point into the other side. And beyond that, obviously, again, we have we have 12. So that would make sense to me from, from that particular point of view anyway. Yes, I mean, what, what I'm saying is if you understand the, the essence of the numbers, because the essence of the numbers is not cultural. It's not cultural at all. It's, the, it's inherent in what the number is. The number is beyond culture and so whatever system we look at kabbalah philosophies from ancient egypt china india native america uh, europe the celts anybody if you if you understand these numbers you can really understand um what they're what they're talking about because the numbers are the same in every system maybe they just bring out different aspects of the number but 11 is like a, it's always a passageway between two great systems. It's always a doorway. It's always a, a boat ride with 11 passengers or, um, you know, in, in, in Chinese uh, feng shui system, there's what are called the magic square of earth and a magic square of heaven. And the numbers on them between earth and heaven and the corresponding parts always add up to 11. It's, you know, it's, it's a passageway. Uh, it, it's like two, you know, if you had one and one and one, you get what's called the digital root of the number and one and one is like two and two is also a passageway number. Um, one and two are considered the parents of numbers, not really numbers themselves. And they give birth to the uh, digits three through nine. In other words, Trinity to the Trinity of Trinities. And with that and zero, you can create everything. You know, three and four and six and eight and 12 are considered structural numbers, the numbers that nature builds with. Mm. Five and 10 are considered numbers of life. You know, the, the flower of every edible fruit has five petals. Five shows up when you slice an apple or five fingers. You, it's associated with life, five and 10. And then seven, nine, and 11 are considered uh, numbers of mystery. They're, uh, they cannot be constructed, you know, seven, nine, and 11 sided figures, regular polygons cannot be constructed with a compass and straight edge. They're mysteries. They're, they're, they're here, but they're not here. <laughs> like seven, the rainbow. It's here. Seven colors of the rainbow are there, but nobody can grab it. Seven is always about things that you can't grab, can't hold on to. The seven notes of the musical scale as the great uh, writer and philosopher antiquarian John Michel said no one has ever had to sweep up after listening to music (laughs) seven is there but not there same with nine and eleven so these numbers one through twelve each have their uh, sort of role or properties and they can be grouped in those four ways what what do you think is behind this construction of of, of the universe the it's a self-replication that is going on that m- mimics itself in, in these shapes and, and in these numbers. Um, do you think that it's simply a, a set of rules that are set in motion at one point, or is it literally a, a creator behind this? Is the numbers the creators uh, maybe th- themselves? What do you think, Michael? Wow, big questions. When you use the word creator, we get into a whole other realm of this. Um, I would say this. I would certainly say that the, the structure of numbers is replicated in the structure of creation. I would say that um, the motivation for the existence of of the universe is wisdom. Wisdom is behind everything. Everywhere is an expression of wisdom. I think that's fundamental to the universe. No one created numbers. We, We create the numeral systems that you know, symbolize numbers. We, you know, the zero, one, two, the squiggles, and the Roman numerals, and the Babylonian numerals. We invent those, but nobody invented numbers. They came simultaneously with the universe, and the universe expresses them. Whether there is a creator behind that, um, you know, I don't want to go anthropomorphic and make 
give human qualities to a creator. But I would say the, the essence of creation is wisdom. Mm. And if the Big Bang actually occurred, I have my doubts that, you know, there was nothing, as someone said, except maybe a suspicious package, which exploded. Nothing exploded and became something. Right. And how, did, how, did, how, did zero, how did it go from zero to one? Yeah. I would say the only thing I could recognize there is uh, a motivation of wisdom. Uh, whether it's divine wisdom, I would suspect so myself. I think uh, the universe is really solid intelligence. Everything we see is some kind of intelligence and wisdom made solid. Whether that's a you know a conscious being, I would even if the word being is correct, consciousness. The universe is the power to be conscious made manifest. That's the best I could go. Mm. But but it's it seems to me to be a benign wisdom. And numbers, the structure of numbers um, are seen in the structure of creation. And why that happened, I don't know. But this is certainly the uh, universe we find ourselves in. One that is uh, a celebration of number and shape, pattern, uh, beauty and wisdom, all expressed through the, uh, materially through the forms we see. You know, the words matter and pattern really go together. They come from the, the Latin roots. Uh, matter comes from mater, mother, and pattern comes from patron, pater, yes. father. So matter and pattern are like the mother and father, you might say, of everything. And that's all we see, matter and patterns. And matter and, and energy, of course, being interchangeable. <clears throat> and, the, and this is... So yes, the big question is a big answer. That's right, that's right. And, and again, it's... This is what we find around us, and this is what we have to work with uh, if we look at it that way. We we haven't been, as far as I know, we haven't been given any instructions, as it were, from from a or the creator. Uh, but there is certain rules here <laughs> and, and certain uh, patterns, just as, as as you say, and, and they're very basic and simple. I think in most cases, humanity are setting out to looking for these vast, big uh, questions. And we, we, we might look, uh, we look too far, so to speak. We look into space or shoot rockets into space to try to figure out what it's all about. But we have mm. clues right here on the, on the planet if we just pay attention and, and look at the simplest little details, and, it, and it's right there. Yes. What is simple is most all-pervading through the universe. What's simple, simple patterns, the simple forms, for example, the five, what are called the five platonic solids, or mathematicians call the regular polyhedra. We some you know these shapes. We see them as a uh, game dice. You know, four-sided dice, uh, six-sided, the usual dice, uh, eight-sided, twelve-sided, twenty-sided. These five shapes, they're called the platonic solids, are the um, the only ways that uh, three-dimensional space can be enclosed using the same triangle or square or pentagon or any regular shape. There are only five ways that this can happen that three-dimensional shape can be um, structured in its basics. And so these five shapes, whoom, everywhere you look, any time of type of three-dimensional structure that occurs in nature um, around a central point. Mm -hmm. Let me be specific with that. So, for example, every crystal in the universe uh, and every crystalline structure uh, uh, from, you know... Uh, and that means that the heart of every atom is uh, a combination of these shapes, these five shapes, at the heart of every atom. So that pervades everywhere. Yes. So we don't have to look to the big, beautiful structures. Look at the little ones, the little basic shapes, triangle, squares, pentagons, boom, every atom there is just from that. <laughs> so looking simply is, is, is the way I, I, I approach things. I, I like it. It's a... I can see the fundamental uh, uh, armature of everything. You know, the circles, the triangles, the spirals. Spiral is the most widespread shape, you know, in the universe. Yes. Tiny whirlpools, uh, you know, in a, in a cup of tea to the giant galaxies and uh, whirlpools of water and hurricanes and tornadoes and um, the, our spiral fist and embryos and curling hair um, ears and uh, you name it. I mean, uh, tendrils of plants. You see the same shape 
it's like a, the forms of nature are like a, and the shapes are like a, the shapes are like a small group of actors that travel around and they change into many costumes in, in their play. But it's the same actors in nature, but they um, have different sizes, different materials, uh, different locations, but it's the same shapes, the same actors, the same spirals, circles, triangles, squares yes. under everything. It's really quite simple, actually. It is, and that's what's uh, so wonderful about it. And it's like rediscovering the most simple things there is, as I went through your book, uh, just beginning with the with the monad going on to, to, to the dyad and just Really, it's realizing how you how you go about logically explaining how, how mm. it works. It it makes incredible sense, but also opens one's eyes in a totally different way. And uh, speaking about some of these different from one to ten that you go through, do do you have personally any like a favorite shape or or, or a number that you continuously uh, go back to? Well, out of the twelve, you know, it's like having children. Um, really. You know, you don't want to have favorites, but certain ones actually stand out. I mean, I love them all. They're all equally wonderful. The ones that the one that really attracts me, though, is the five, the pentagon, the pentagram, the five petaled, five sided shape. Mm. Um, if you if you look at the chapters, I I didn't uh, their sizes. I didn't do this on purpose, but you know, one is small, two gets bigger, three, four, five is the largest. And then they go down six, seven, eight, nine, ten, smaller again. Five was the largest because it um, it uh, relates to, or it's formed by what's called the golden ratio. You know, which is really just the uh, relationship of the bones of our fingers as they get smaller to larger, larger to smaller, or the uh, it's the relationship of where our um, wrist divides the distance from our elbow to our fingertip, or where our navel divides our body or where our nose divides our face. It's all the same ratio. It's found in seashells and flowers and wherever you see spirals. So that's what made the chapter so large. It mm. contains the golden ratio and the spiral. And um, so um, it, it, it's quite interesting to me. It, it, it may be a favorite. 12 is also a favorite. Three, they all have their, their beauties. Yes. You know, but I really am attracted to this uh, five and the golden ratio. It's it's so quite interesting. It's at the essence of the uh, design of um, pine cones. You know, this, anything you see spiraling in nature, the way leaves come off of plants or cauliflower patterns. It's all these so-called Fibonacci numbers. Yes. And five and the golden ratio and the spiral. A pentagram shape. It's it's a, it's it's one that seems to attract me uh, quite the most. It is really uh, spectacular. And and uh, have you compared uh, this particular? Uh, I mean, it's not really a theory or, or thesis as such. It's it's just a presentation of what is there and what it is. But if we look at, there's another aspect in terms of how uh, how these uh, patterns and and shapes and numbers repeat themselves, which is termed the uh, the holographic universe, for instance, I'm sure you heard of it, Michael Talbot, uh, his book. Yeah. And, and obviously, there is a similarity there in the approach that it's it's it, you, you, in the smallest little detail you can you can find the how, how the pattern of the of the largest thing is, so to speak, and 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 it's uh, you can look up or you can look down and you will find the same similar pattern everywhere. So there is a similarity to me there. But w what do you think about that, Michael? Yes, it's absolutely true. That's one of the basic characteristics of the universe is the the holographic model or the Sometimes called a fractal, or the idea that it, the idea is that the the parts model each other and the whole, even though it may not be obvious. For example, we can find the proportions of the entire human body, and the proportions of the bones of the the hand and the forearm. We can find the um, as I mentioned the uh, the pattern of the of the branches of a tree in the pattern of the leaf. We find the um, you know the the entire universe. I mean, if we think of the, uh, the the moon goes around the Earth, and the Earth goes around the Sun, and the Sun goes around its Sun. It's speculated, which goes around the galaxy, and then there are clusters of galaxies that swirl. The idea of the the, the model each each section is like a model of the larger section, and each larger section is made of smaller sections. 
I think the best example of this is the cauliflower. You know that that vegetable? Yes. You see them in different um, colors these days. But if you look at the whole cauliflower, it's like a big bump. And it's made of smaller bumps. And if you look at each smaller bump, they're made of smaller bumps. And each smaller bump is made of smaller bumps. And each of these bumps is made of spirals of these smaller bumps. And it spirals within spirals within spirals in the cauliflower. So uh, my best guess, the, the best model I have for the shape of the entire universe is a cauliflower. And it's uh, there's another one. Uh, what is it called again? Romanesco broccoli oh, or something like that. Yes, I mean, that's that, fantastic. That uh... that is my favorite of the cauliflower strain. The Romanesco. The uh, the angles are very sharp. You know, it's a green cauliflower. I think it came out of Japan. It's the the sharp, You can really see the sharpness of the of the spirals within spirals within spirals on them. Oh, I love those. It's uh, fractal uh, vegetables, as it were. <laughs> yeah, all the, actually, all the plants are fractals. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, the the leaf is a model of the uh, twig, which is a model of the branch, which is a model of the bough, which is a model of the whole tree. Each section. This, this is the, this is the basis of the uh, Japanese art of bonsai. You know, the miniature plants, where they they take a branch and they plant it as if it's an entire little tree. You know, those that bonsai uh, plants. And so that's the idea behind that, the fractal holographic model where the parts model each other in the whole. And that's, again, the essence of the golden ratio. Yes. That's, that's the idea of what it's about. And the, the five-pointed star, every space in the five-pointed star can create another five-pointed star. Even the triangular spaces can create five-pointed stars and smaller ones and smaller ones. And that's why we see this uh, fiveness uh, so often in nature, it, it means that nature is uh, building itself out of smaller and smaller models of itself. And the reason is that it can all uh, balance, you know, there, uh, a tree or a, a bush with different five petaled flowers on it will have those flowers at different sizes, different stages of growth, different locations, and yet the whole plant balances perfectly. Whole trees balance with their tens of thousands of you know, branches mm. and leaves, and they'll balance. Doesn't anybody wonder how that happens? <laughs> That's right. It's because the parts model the whole. And when you do that, when you build that way, the whole will balance, and, and the parts will balance. It's a complete, complete harmony. It's a wonderful lesson from nature. Yeah, so it's, it, that's how it can grow from... Uh, the smallest little seed, uh, basically, up to this giant, because it's it's spiraling upward and, and outward in a, in a fractal Fibonacci sequence, right? Fibonacci sequences, exactly. Wherever you see these uh, these Fibonacci numbers, you know the the sequence starts zero and one, nothing and something. It's sort of like the Big Bang, so to speak. And the rule is that each two numbers, these two numbers, add to make the next. So zero plus one make one. Then 1 plus 1 make 2, 1 plus 2 make 3, 2 plus 3, 5, 3 plus 5, 8, 13, 21, 34. These are the numbers that we find as the uh, the petals on a flower. You know, I don't know if you have in, in your country the um, old thing of uh, plucking petals, she loves me, she loves me not, she right. loves me, she loves me not. Sure. Well, you can actually make it come out the way you want <laughs> if you know which flowers tend towards which Fibonacci numbers. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, a little useful knowledge there. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the, 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 pe the petals of flowers, the numbers of spirals um, going around uh, pine cone in each direction will be consecutive Fibonacci numbers or on a pineapple or asparagus or artichoke, wherever you see spirals crossing. Where spirals cross, something comes out, a leaf, a branch, a flower, yeah, it's a very interesting phenomenon. Do you think that human design still have a long way to go in terms of maybe how we build buildings that could, uh, let's say we're living in a, in a zone where it's earthquakes or something like that, uh, that we, we could learn also how to, how to build and, and replicate what nature already done in order to make it last longer or, or, or of, of that nature? I think so. I think nature knows what to do and we're best to uh, study it. You know, one of, one of um, my interests is uh, plants, plant geometry, plant chemistry. I really think that the uh, the solution 
to worldwide energy problems must be in understanding how plants work, how chlorophyll converts sunlight into energy yes. and, in, and rearranges matter this way. I, I, can, I can only think that uh, if we study the secrets of chlorophyll, of, this, of photosynthesis, we can go most directly to the most practical and cleanest solution. I think we may be a, a way off, but I wish that uh, governments would invest, uh, would focus on that. You know, focus like a, a sunlight on it, no pun intended. <laughs> because I think if we study nature, we'll get the most efficient ways to work. Nature's certainly most efficient, gets the most out of the least. Yes. You know, this is the idea of the circle. The circle contains, for, for, the, for the same distance around, you know, if we took a loop of string and made it a circle, a triangle, a square, the same loop would contain the most area as a circle, the least area as a triangle, and intermediate areas as other shapes. It's sort of counterintuitive. You'd think the same loop would make the same area. Mm. But the circle contains the, the most. So if you, wanna, um, if you like pizza and you like toppings, you want to get the most toppings, uh, if you have a choice between a square pizza and a round pizza, and they have the same length of crust, the round pizza will have more toppings. You see. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this is this is how we can use our intelligence in in mundane ways for pizza, and in grand ways for uh, energy solutions by studying nature. You know, e energy moves in spirals whenever we leave it alone. So I would think spiral motion would be another way to study how energy can be um, created, uh, used, and conserved most efficiently. Yes, I agree with you. I think the studying nature will provide a lot of solutions. And I think scientists are coming to that. Engineers are coming to that because that's what works. Yes. That's what's most efficient. And then little by little, we, we, we walk towards that. What can you say about... Um ancient and, and, and current religions as well. They seem to have obviously in, in one form or another uh, saved or, or picked up on some of these things. We, we can see it in some of the Islamic art. Uh, there's a certain number system there. We obviously have the, uh, the, the wonderful uh, the windows of, of many of the cathedrals, uh, Gothic cathedrals. Uh, there's other places as well, obviously in Egypt. In, in your book you detail even the, the face mask of, of King Tut, if that's indeed what it is. But uh, mm -hmm. it, it's there, nonetheless. It's, it's, we can find that pattern in there. And again, do you think that those things have been an accident? Or do you think that people who constructed these things and painted uh, these, these temples were aware of what they were doing at that point? I think that certain people uh, among them were aware. There was a core of um, teachers in, in, in each of these. Um, what they did is they encoded their knowledge and their wisdom in their sacred architecture. If we understood if we understood it, we'd see great wisdom being taught there. Sacred architecture is generally a microcosm of the of the knowledge of the whole universe. You know, these ancient sites like Stonehenge and so forth, not only were they um, uh, astronomical uh, devices for understanding the movements of the sun and the moon and the planets and the stars, but they also encoded their wisdom in the in the proportions and the dimensions of these. You know, these stone hinges and wood hinges that are found all through Europe. They were actually schools, and the large ones were actually universities where knowledge was taught, real knowledge uh, about the uh, the way the universe works, the way nature works, and the, and they were schools all over the place. They were schools. They're not recognized as such now. They encoded their knowledge in their architecture and in their art. And um, we can read it somewhat. You know, there, there's great work been done by uh, John Michel and John Neal mm. in terms of uh, measurement. John, John Neal's book, uh, uh, All Done with Mirrors, and John Michel's work, M-I-C-H-E-L-L, -L, uh, the late, great John Michel, his work... Uh, the dimensions of paradise and uh, how the world is made according to sac sacred geometry, um, a new book, uh, shows how, how these ancient structures encoded their knowledge uh, uh, of measure 
and proportion and design in nature. And it, even even alphabets, certain alphabets through nature, I, through, excuse me, through history, uh, the Greek, the Egyptian, uh, the Hebrew, the uh, Sanskrit, Syriac, certain languages even were built uh, to model the, uh, the sacred nature and patterns of the universe. You know, we've lost touch these days <clears throat> with the essence of religion. I mean, uh, just look around and, and religion is, is disparaged and, and uh, you know, sacred books are looked at as uh, mythologies and fairy tales and, you know, uh, ancient uh, um, ideas to be disregarded. Okay. If we read them on the surface, you might get that opinion. But if you read them a little deeper, and if you, you have to have knowledge. See, most people, they don't really have the knowledge that these ancient people had in terms of uh, astronomy and, and music and, and so forth. You can read in them great wisdom. The Bible, great, great wisdom. But it's lost, and people don't know how to read the symbolism anymore. If you look at them, you, you find all these interesting numbers that come about. You know, there'd be seven this and seven that and 144,000 that and 12 of this and 72 of that. You, you, when you see that, you know there's something deeper that they're saying on a different level. And um, I don't know if that'll get uh, rediscovered or if it will be um, – uh, tossed into the dustbin of history, hmm. but the great, the great works, the great religious sacred uh, books um, through history, and the architecture they built, the Islamic art, the um, cathedrals, the the temples, and the the sacred places, they encode this wisdom for their people uh, from those times, and maybe maybe someday we'll discover it and uh, appreciate appreciate it again. I don't know, though. It, it feels like we're also in uh, this situation where we interpret things literally instead of, as you say, looking at the reading between the lines and, and, and seeing what is there veiled and, and what is what is hidden in, in one way. But do you think that, again, why do you think that it has been, if we make that assumption, that it has been hidden from regular people? Some priest classes in the ancient ancient world have have had it, or at least the architects who built their, their temples mm -hmm. have had this knowledge. Mm -hmm. But it's been, it's like, it's there, uh, in some cases, right in front of you, in the in the church that you go to, in the, or temple, or, or where, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. But there's not a literal, or a, a direct communication from, from the priesthood to you about these things. Why, why do you think that is? Well, well, it's lost, I think, even to the priesthood today. Um, they, they may have some of it, but uh, they don't really, I don't think... Um, well, at least on the externals, there must be in each group a core group that still have this knowledge. I'm sure of it. Um, but it, it's not just like just as our teachers couldn't teach us about the connections to nature uh, with mathematics. The priesthood today, uh, you know, everybody's gone very literal. It's it's one of the most surprising things to me. I, I would have thought we would have gotten more abstract, but things are taken so literal, literally. And I think this is because our ed educational systems. I don't know about yours, but I think ours have gotten dumber. Same here. I think I same here. Yeah. I think that th things that we concentrate are not important really. I think it, it's it's what makes people into the education system is more about making people into uh, cogs in a machine. You know, it's about fitting in. Yeah. Rather than discovering and leading, you know. Um and truly understanding it, it, what it's, and it's, truly understanding, it's, it, there's, there's no call for it. Everybody's in a rush to get a job and make money and so forth. And there's nothing wrong with that aspect of life. That's essential, absolutely essential. But there's more to it. And uh, our our leaders, you know, in government, in, in religion, in education, they don't really know it themselves. That's my impression anyway. Yeah. And, and based on the results. But it's there, and I think it's for individuals and small groups to uh, to rediscover. What, what can you say in terms of corporate logotypes and, and, and things in the corporate uh, world? There, there seems to be a, a preservation there, at least, uh, in many yes. cases, right? Yes, and that's it's, uh, interesting and ironic, is that one of the places that this knowledge is being preserved, shall we say, but for really nefarious purposes, for manipulation purposes, is the power of these proportions 
uh, on us. The power of these shapes um, are used in terms of um, advertising and corporate logos and, and so forth for the purposes of manipulation. See, they know either intuitively or intentionally that the um, that these por- proportions, certain proportions and shapes, have a very powerful effect on us. So they incorporate them into the logos and advertising, and they have a kind of a mesmerizing effect. And they're making use of them. So it's ironic that's where uh, some of this knowledge uh, is being preserved. But then again, it's not unusual to preserve knowledge that way. I think in in times past, when when um, uh, wiser ones among us realize that we, we go into these periods of darkness and ignorance, they say, well, let's preserve the knowledge. How can we do it? Well, people are going to gamble and dance and so forth. Let's build them into the folk dances. Let's build them into the design of a deck of cards with yeah. 52 you know, and so forth. And So they built this knowledge into all sorts of um, you know, virtues and vices. So at least it would be preserved. But it's it's kind of um, uh, I see how the advertising does use this. It's very astute to notice that. But that's where they're using a lot of this knowledge. Do you think that it's um, this is used simply to manipulate people actually into to buying more or getting a certain uh, uh, attraction to a company logo, for instance, or, or or to get that familiarity between you and and the brand, I guess, in one way? Or or do you think that there could there be something else behind that? No, I think it's uh, it. I mean, to me, it seems to be about attraction to uh, make purchases. That's what the um, intent of the corporations are. I think uh, I haven't, um, I don't see them as really being, uh, I mean, I, they're important. I'm not against corporations, but I, uh, you know, but I do see how, uh, it, it seems to be about manipulation. It doesn't seem to be um, altruistic in terms of let's bring joy to the populace. That's right. It's about mm, let's get them to notice us. You know, certain colors and certain proportions and certain shapes are very attractive. You know, they, you know, people, uh, psychologists study, they, they put cameras in supermarkets and study people's eye movements. You know that. Yeah. And so they, they look to see where people are looking in the aisles and they, they set up certain aisles as test cases to see if certain colors, proportions, heights and so forth attract people. And, and you know, they're, they're there to make money for their stockholders and, Uh, good luck to everybody. I mean, the best companies win, and <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, yeah. that's the, I mean, that's the, that's why Darwinian um, evolutionary uh, theory is so strong because it really supports the corporate um, structuring. You know, survival of the fittest, etc. Yes, <clears throat> yes, it's all uh, competitive in that in that way, and uh, and just as as you say, I, I would agree with you. There's nothing particularly wrong w- with the corporate world as such, but the 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 problem or the cr- the crux that is happening right now is that we don't have any of that spiritual essence left, it feels like, in, in our lives anymore as people are walking maybe away from the church. And initially that might that's a, might be a, seen as a good thing by many people also. Uh, but at the same time, what, what I'm getting at is that many people walk out on, on the little spirituality that even was in the church at that point as well. And mm-hmm. and they try to the, maybe they try to get that by... Uh, going over to a, a brand instead, or, or in other words, they're attracted to certain things in the corporate world because, on some super, superficial level, they uh, they give you what you want in terms of these sacred numbers and shapes. Again, uh, I don't know if that's yeah. true, but what, what do you think, Michael? Yeah, we're, we're we are attracted to these. Um, you know, uh, I, I think people, uh, m- many people. It's hard to generalize, but many people are moving away from the uh, organized religious institutions, and they're seeking spirituality through the through their you know searches that people are searching i think everything that anybody does at any time regardless is really a search for god in some form or and which really means a search for the deepest essence of ourself uh and i yes people people are attracted to these people are uh, certainly attracted to logos to corporation uh, well p- People, a lot of people want family. The the urge to the tribal group is very, very strong. To the to the and to group thinking, which is really sad and dangerous. Yes. Uh, but there's there's a there's a real urge to that because people are rejecting the past, but don't don't know really know where to go in the future. Yeah. You know, so that people are trying uh, different things, but the 
the the the lessons of of peace and harmony and and spirit are really all around us, all within us, uh, but we we don't recognize it generally. I mean, we can feel it, you know, but where to go, people don't always know. So you know, if we if we hold to the truths that are capital T truths, the the, the eternal truths and look to those which are represented by numbers and shapes, which are really expressions of, pri- of principles. You know, two polarity, three is about balance and strength and so forth. Hmm. If we look to the eternal principles, um, not as objects of worship or anything like that, but a- as for feelings of, of, uh, of um, trust and, and security, that's where, that's where security lies in, in what's eternally true. Yeah. You know, and and while these shapes in nature are not worthy of being objects of worship, they remind us that there is goodness uh, at the heart of things. And I think if we focus on that, we attract uh, goodness to us, and good luck and prosperity and happiness. Uh, I think what we what we shape in ourselves is what we find happening around us. Right, and we we might be, as you say, have a sense of comfort in the fact that the universe isn't chaotic it isn't random it isn't uh, designed to to devour itself in that sense it's it's a creative mm-hmm. force and and it's there and again if we look at it from the darwinian point of view that you brought up before then it's easy for us to maybe to get that idea that uh, everything is in competition competition with everything else and it's it's everything is falling apart instead of actually building up to something as well oh it's always building always transforming you know, it's, it, it's always like, like I said, it's always a riptide. There's always something going in this direction. There's always something going in the opposite direction. When something is crumbling, there's also something somewhere that's building. Just the way that, that things work. And so um, in times of trans, transformation, transition, which I think we're clearly in, in terms of societies and people's understandings and people's longings and you know, what's working in the world, what's not working in the world. We're in this transition, this riptide period. And so along with the confusion, it's also good to um, realize that there is goodness here and that there, um, there, there, are, there are messages to us in everything that are telling us that, okay, it may look chaotic on some level, on that level, but at the foundation of it, it's striving for goodness. With uh, with some of the other more dire things that that we talked about here, with, with those things in mind, are you, overall are you are you positive or, or or negative in terms of where human the human being the human race is going overall? Human race? Yeah. Well, um, uh, on on topics like this, I'm usually wrong because the unexpected always happens. But I would say short term negative, long term positive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I could, could be wrong. I, I could certainly be wrong. I could, it could certainly long-term positive is good. Short term. I don't know. It just seems to me to be that the things that are not working anymore are crumbling and that new institutions should arise or will arise naturally in their places. Yes. But what doesn't work, you know, I, I don't know. I think there's all kinds of manipulations going on and, and so forth. It, it just, Somehow the the worst in people seems to get brought out at certain times, but there are enough good people also, and so uh, it's a confluence of events. There's a crumbling and a building going on. So um, it, historically, in transition times, you know, it gets uh, darkest before the dawn. So I mm. expect something like that, but it could be you know dawn in four minutes from now, as far as I know. It could it could be um, it could be that humans uh, will uh, smarten up and uh, and you know do what's right in the world. Yeah. You know, let our let our conscience be our guide, and let nature and and numbers and shapes and uh, and let beauty and truth be our guide. I know these sound like corny abstractions, but they're literal. These these truths are all around us in the in the ordinary shapes and patterns. Uh, that we see, and and if we can understand those principles, I think we'll feel a lot better about uh, where everything is at. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And 
And again, I, I just urge all our listeners who aren't yet already familiar with it to discover this book by Michael S. Schneider, A, Beginning, A Beginner's Guide to Constructing the Universe, The Mathematical Archetypes of Nature, Art, and Science, A Voyage from 1 to 10. It's, it's wonderful, and I think it's a good step in that direction in, ter- in terms of changing people's overall perception and, and relationship to, to reality and, and nature as well. Uh, Michael, why don't you tell us about your website and where people can go to, to pick up a copy of this book if they're interested? Well, the, uh, I don't sell the book itself. Um, on, online, it can be purchased much cheaper than I can even purchase it you know, from my publisher. Uh, so I recommend people uh, buy it. Well, first of all, I, I say support your local independent bookstore. And if you can't order through them, then buy it online or through another bookstore. But my website, uh, constructingtheuniverse.com, uh, constructing the universe, like the title of the book. Uh, if you go there, I you know I put out some interesting things for people to see and do. And I also offer uh, I've created a set of six uh, activity books or workbooks for people who want to learn how to use a compass and straight edge on their own, you know, step by step at your own pace. Very simple. And I show you how it relates to nature uh, and to art. And it's really good for not just young people, but everybody, because nobody's had a really good education in this. And it's also especially good for artists and architects and craftspeople to see what these great proportions are, are and how to use them, how, how they have been used and how to use them. So I have a set of six activity books and I, I ship them internationally. So I'd be happy uh, to hear from your listeners. Right, that's wonderful. Constructingtheuniverse.com, that's the website. And uh, in terms of classes and things like that, is there anything else you'd like to mention to our listeners of uh, if they're interested in joining one of your classes, can they do that through your website as well, or how does that work? Well, right now I'm only teaching in uh, Northern California in my own classroom, but I am uh, doing my best to record these uh, on, on film to uh, be able to make DVDs for sale. So keep in touch with my website, and I hope by the end of the year to have a, a number of DVDs about the numbers and about art and uh, nature and this kind of philosophy and things that people can do, you know, that you can actually do and see and start to notice. Uh, one of my workbooks has these uh, plastic uh, uh, lenses, you might say, that you look through uh, with geometry on them uh, at images on the book. In the book, I have images of nature, art, technology, uh, with all the shapes, and you put these little plastic pieces on them, and you see how all these beautiful works of art and nature and technology have been designed. Then you can take these pieces out outdoors and look at nature through them, or you can take them to museums. I love this, and look at the art, certain yeah. art, yeah. especially if it's round or square, triangle. You can look at the art through it and see, oh, I see how it's structured. So that's my volume six of these. So. Um, if anybody wants those, they're for sale on my website, constructingtheuniverse.com. Thank you for having me mention that. All right, excellent. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and for your time, uh, Michael. I know you're very busy, but keep up the great work, and, and we'd love to obviously have you back and talk about maybe some of the numbers. Sometimes it's four. If it's a very slow crack, it'll crack in four. But three pulls together you know, very, very quickly, and uh, just by noticing ordinary shapes all around us, uh, it enriches our lives. Absolutely, and, uh, and the, there's so much to say, obviously, here in terms of uh, art. Even if we look, if we look at art specifically, I, I guess one question that's always intrigued me is why people and human beings overall are, are attracted to certain shapes and, and patterns in art. We, we're obviously during the Renaissance, many people weren't too savvy to some of these aspects here, but today many people are looking into the sacred geometry that are hidden in a lot of motifs on, on, on some of the early Renaissance paintings. These are these continuing to the modern day, of course, as well, by artists who are in the know about these things. But why would you say that we are attracted to them? Are, are these symbols also, or, or patterns or numbers, are they also part of us in, in one way? Do they resonate with us, or why are we attracted to them, do you think? Yes, I, I have to say so. Um, some, some people theorize that uh, we are attracted to them because we've been around them in nature so much that we're used to them. But I think it goes even deeper than that. I think it is a part of us, a part of our uh, fabric. We're, we're, we're a legitimate part of this universe just as much as anything else. And we have in us 
the same, um, shall we call them, archetypes in a, in a Jungian sense, archetypal patterns, the idea of uh, equality. We can feel it, and that's the circle. The circle is about equality in all directions as, it, as a circle spreads out from the center. That's one of its things. And the other shapes, they're archetypes within us, and we recognize them. They, they, they feel right. We, we recognize their correctness. And artists, since prehistory, have recognized that certain proportions, the proportions found in the circle, for example, pi, or in the triangle, the square root of three, and the square, the square root of two, certain proportions um, and the, the, what the shape is about, because there are no accidents you know, in, in nature in the sense that uh, a five-petal flower is not an accident. There's a reason for that fiveness, for its unfolding, for its, un- its harmony, its balance. Um, and if we can read, read the simple shapes, understand what you know, each shape is about, what is the circle about, what is the triangle about, and so forth, we can understand what nature is trying to do in any situation. And then we can work with it rather than against it. That's right. And uh, again, if we look at anything in nature, pretty much, we can slice an apple in half. We can look at how the branches grow uh, on on a tree and how the leaves are composite. These are things that at the initial stage might seem chaotic to us and and random. But but what you really detail in your book, obviously, is that all these things have a particular pattern to them. And there is a a logic about how nature creates these things and put them together, right? Oh, it's a beautiful and simple logic. It's uh, nature is the best teacher. You know, people have said that nature holds the patent, the original patent on every human invention. If we look to the way nature does things, we'll get the most efficient, energy conserving, and also beautiful uh, result. You see, uh, it, it's all readable, and, and it's all down to simple shapes. It's not. Uh, we don't need complex equations and graphs and abstract. Uh, you know, formulas and so forth. Just, just start to look at simple shapes. Nature's, uh, you know, circles, the uh, squares, the triangles, pentagons, hexagons. You know, I, I can name dozens of examples for every one of these. And when we start to see them, maybe even the cracks in the sidewalk. Yes. Walk around, we see cracks in the sidewalk. Do we notice that they're uh, usually three corner cracks, like like uh, the capital letter Y? In English, you know, the three three meet at one point. Why does nature do three? Mathematics to nature, it would open everyone's eyes. It would it would change our outlook on not just mathematics, but the entire world, the cosmos, yes, and, and our place in it. Did you come from an interest in in math or geometry or art or maybe even architecture at the beginning before you uh, wrote the book? Well. Um, what, as a teenager, as I was about 16, I got very interested in the uh, mathematics of nature, and I decided to get uh, degrees in mathematics so that I could understand this better. That was my real interest in that. Uh, plus, mathematics seemed to me to be a kind of a, uh, a language like poetry. There was something very beautiful in it. Now, I was not a very good mathematics student all through school. I didn't like it at all. It was... Uh, seemed to me to be uh, mostly memorization of rules and it was just overwhelming. It, it didn't, uh, it, it wasn't taught the way I would have liked it to have been taught. <laughs> exactly. Same, same from my point of view, Michael, that's what I tried and to just, mention. Just about everybody's, you know, our, yeah. our teachers didn't know this and their teachers didn't know this. Plus the emphasis is on, um, you know, getting a job, getting into the high tech, getting all that, uh, information rather than see the, uh, beauty the absolute beauty behind it, uh, and available to everyone. That's, that's the wonderful thing about this. This is not uh, the mathematics of nature uh, and art um, and technology is not beyond um, anyone's uh, vision if you understand how to read the simple shapes of things and the simple numbers. You know, we talk about, uh, the, we have the phrase, the book of nature. Well, it's quite, quite true, actually. And if we realize that the, the language in which the book of nature is written is, as Galileo said, uh, an alphabet of simple shapes like triangles, circles, squares, pentagons, and their combinations, uh, you, you can actually read this book. And if you understand, um, have a more powerful effect on us. 
And this is what uh, artists, architects, designers, craftspeople of all ages knew. In fact, in certain societies, it was law that you had to create only using certain proportions. Mm. Ancient Egypt, for example. Right. Uh, proportions that would, even if you didn't understand them, that you'd be surrounded. Ordinary, ordinary people in their ordinary utensils and furniture and buildings and art and so forth would be surrounded by certain proportions that would encourage harmonious feelings. They, they knew the laws of this, and they, and they were very... Uh, they were very adamant about it. And that's why Egyptian civilization lasted 33 centuries. <laughs> they knew certain things about maintaining harmony within the individual, within the family, within the, within the, within the town, within the nation. And China was also like this, that if you can maintain harmony at its earliest levels through uh, proportions of objects and also harmonious music, for example, in China... India, Egypt, um, certain music was lawful and certain music and musical rhythms and patterns were unlawful because they would disrupt the peace of the soul and thus the family, thus the town, thus the nation. Hmm. Um, you know, that, that's not done in democratic societies. Everything goes. Hmm. But in those days, that, that's how they, in, they kept their society uh, enduring uh, by keeping as closely as possible to the um, proportions, the archetypal proportions found in nature, in their art, and even the design of society. Yeah. You see? Do, do but you but see... certain, certain proportions have a very a more powerful effect on us uh, than others. And, and this was the really open secret among artists and architects and craftspeople over many centuries. Do you see more or less of this knowledge coming into the world today? Let me just say first that your book, A Beginner's Guide to Constructing the Universe, is a wonderful book filled with amazing discoveries and knowledge about nature's numerical language and how the universe is constructed. It's uh, beautifully put together with diagrams, graphics, images and explanations to how nature is constructed and will give you the logic behind the numbers as well. Uh, I've always had somewhat difficult and uh, most of the time excruciating experiences with math and math teachers and math classes. Uh, partly because all these mathematical rules that were thrown out at me and never properly explained. Uh, it was simply so much that didn't make sense to me. And I guess that is the case with inquisitive minds that want to understand why something is in, in a certain way. Uh, just taking the words uh, of the teacher or uh, an authority's words for it is not good enough. But uh, if I and I think most other students as well would have been given just a fraction of some of the wondrous qualities of our 1 to 10 number system that you detail in your book, Michael, I think we would have uh, had a completely different approach uh, to numbers and math overall. So it's wonderful that you've written a book and that you're teaching classes, Michael. I think it's uh, what all children should be given a chance to, uh, to learn at least. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I am teaching classes. I teach college classes at the California College of the Arts in San Francisco. And I have my own classroom where I teach whatever I'm interested in, and I seem to uh, have found people who are also interested in it. Yes, uh, it's a shame that children aren't shown the connection between simple numbers, simple shapes, uh, nature, and, and even art. And it leads into philosophy. It's a very positive outlook. It, instead of seeing the world as a crazy, fragmented, dangerous place, uh, we can concentrate on the, the beautiful order and harmonies that actually underlie everything. And I think if children are shown the connection just simply of...